Hey there fellow Planeswalkers, I'm Justice, aka Gatewatcher, and this video is brought to you by viewers like you, so please drop a like, hit that subscribe button, and check out my Patreon for additional content. You can also help by shopping my online merch store on Threadless. Thanks for your support. Alright, let's get into it. The storyline of Magic the Gathering is centered around Planeswalkers traveling to various planes and doing things, fighting bad guys, and looking good doing it. But what exactly is a plane, and how do planeswalkers actually operate? If you read the title and click this video, this is the question you came here to be answered, and I, like a sphinx, will riddle you a mind-bending explanation as to what is happening in this fantastical multiverse. If you're just here because YouTube has this on autoplay, good job YouTube for getting me viewers, and good job to you for being the lucky recipient of this arcane knowledge. So let's dive into the cosmology of Magic the Gathering. A plane is referred to as a self-contained planet or universe of any size. They can be natural or artificial, relatively Earth-sized, or the size of a fishbowl. Whenever a planeswalker moves to a new plane, they are handily sized and weighted accordingly. Dominaria is about two and a half times the size of Earth, but luckily for planeswalkers that don't want to be pinned down to the ground by astronomical forces, gravity doesn't work scientifically speaking because... MAGIC! At the center of Magic's planes is the nexus of the multiverse. It's unverified if it's the center of all planes or just a certain area of planes. Kind of like an eye of a galaxy where there's other galaxies, just not nearby. This central spot on the MTG multiverse has the unique advantage of pulling in magical energy, or mana, from other planes through mana lines. These mana lines, commonly referred to as ley lines, are very important fabrics of the universe, which flow through and connect planes, granting them their magical energies. In game, whenever you tap a land for mana, you're sucking magical energy out of ley lines in your natural surroundings in order to power your spellcasting. All ley line paths will eventually coalesce at the nexus of the multiverse. This central point isn't stationary though, as the multiverse is always in motion. For a long time, Dominaria was the Nexus, which gives reason as to why a good chunk of Magic's history is focused there. The Nexus has since moved on, leaving Dominaria to be a standard plane. In order for a Planeswalker to move to a new plane, they must traverse through the Blind Eternities. The Blind Eternities is the hazardous magical space soup in between planes. It consists of Aether, Mana, and Temporal energy. Planeswalkers utilize the Aether within to summon creatures to fight alongside them. Whenever you cast a creature, you aren't really summoning the real deal. You're creating a magical copy of a creature you've met before, pulling it from the ether. It's also important to note that the Blind Eternities aren't exactly a location. It's more like a doorway that one passes through. Us three-dimensional beings can't quite comprehend what is essentially fourth-dimensional space. Even the characters in MTG don't quite understand it, and all their minds tend to attempt to make sense of it in strange ways. Even stranger, the Blind Eternities are home to other incomprehensible things, the Eldrazi. These interdimensional beings' origin is eerily unknown. What we do know about them is that the one called Ulamog destroys planes, Kozilek reshapes them, and Emrakul deals with the biology of them. When they enter a plane, they take on physical form in the shape of titans. Though Ugin, a 25,000-year-old elder dragon, explains that their physical manifestation is similar to a man poking a finger into a pool. The Eldrazi, and assumedly planeswalkers, follow mana ley lines as a sort of magical highway. Nahiri, a core planeswalker from Zendikar, was able to manipulate ley lines to summon the third known titan, Emrakul, to the plane of Innistrad, aka the Goth Plane. In a strange turn of events, Emrakul communicated with the Gatewatch's Jace Bellerin, where it appeared as the angel Emiria, its perceived deity form. Here she tells Jace that her presence on the plane is untimely, the plane isn't ready for her. She also says that she doesn't know that she's speaking with Jace, so this pseudo-psychic link Jace is having is all in all a really weird time for all parties involved. But you know. Magic. Emrakul eventually relinquishes and becomes encased in the Silver Moon of Innistrad, where it is currently sealed. It is unknown if there are more Titans in the multiverse, or if these three are the only ones, but it could be inferred that they're a sort of cosmic life cycle, destroying old planes to allow for new ones. Ugin is very concerned with the destruction of the two titans Ulamog and Kozilek and what it means in relation to the multiverse, but that theory is for another video. So, we've covered the nexus of the multiverse, the ley lines that connect it to all of the planes, and the blind eternities that serve as the supercharged doorways to access the planes, giving us a lovely and tangible 4D map of the multiverse. So, let's talk about the actual planes. A plane is an isolated location that may have vastly differing physical properties. Dominaria is similar to a standard fantasy Middle-Earth. It has stars and additional planets, making this plane an entire solar system. When we talk about a certain plane, we typically state the name of the area us planeswalkers interact with. So in the case of the plane of Ixalan, we're merely describing the plane in which Ixalan, the continent, is located on. Other planes can be much smaller and physically different. For example, Theros is a plane composed of three layers. The Underworld at the bottom, the Mortal Realm in the middle, and the Nyx Realm at the top. There is no outer space. All the stars are just the underside of Nyx. 
there are also very real edges to this plane. Thanks to the Commander Legends flavor text on Horizon Stone, we know that one of the oldest gods, Krufix, may have discovered a land past this edge. This could mean that there is either more to the plane of Theros than we know of, or Krufix is unknowingly a planeswalker and sleepwalked to the neighboring plane. Krufix is technically kinda sorta an artificial being, meaning he's ineligible to be a planeswalker, but we all saw what happened with the Calyx, so yeah. Theros is really weird in terms of cosmology and rules because... Magic. Personally, I want to mind crew fix God of Horizons being a new Simic Planeswalker. Eh, that's a different video. Back to the planes. One of the smallest planes known as Segovia, which is about 1 100th the size of Earth. Planeswalkers shrink down to proper size to visit this plane, which kind of begs the question of how do we know that Segovia is so small? When I summon a Segovian Angel, it comes out the size of a bug. But if I had seen a Segovian Angel, it would have looked human-sized to me. What would happen if I summoned a Demir spy bug while I was on Segovia? Would it be summoned at 1 100th scale like me, or at 1 to 1 scale like Segovian Angel does? What happens if I summon the BFI while on Segovia? Oh no. Planes also have a thing called a World Soul, which is an aware essence of a plane. It can manifest itself as an avatar, be harmed by magical means, and if a World Soul happens to lose its plane, it can reattach itself to another planar planeswalker. Yeah, Davriel has a whole World Soul attached to him. Wouldn't know that by his lackluster card, would ya? It is also highly inferred that planes have a sort of signature essence to them, possibly connected to their world soul. When a planeswalker spark ignites and sends them to a new plane for the first time, it is often in connection to either the planeswalker or the emotional ignition, sending them to the most relevant area relating to mana affinity. When Chandra sparked, she was sent to Ragatha, the plane of literal fire. Go figure. When a Johnny sparked, he landed in Jund, explained by Sarkon due to his emotional rage and the ferocity of the plane. Outside of accidentally sparking, whenever a planeswalker purposely moves to a new plane, it takes magical effort. The Blind Eternities are a hostile force that only planeswalkers and godlike beings can successfully pass through. Normal organic matter cannot interact with it. Thankfully, personal items can come along as well, otherwise we'd have a bunch of naked planeswalkers popping up like the Terminator. This limitation wasn't always the case, as prior to the Great Mending, planeswalkers had godlike powers, were immortal, could transport other creatures to different planes, and do pretty much anything else they wanted. After planeswalkers messed around too much and almost tore the multiverse apart with time rifts, Jessica gave a big reset and nerfed all the planeswalkers, turning them from gods into superheroes. This no biological extras allowed rule is occasionally bent. Mowu the dog accompanies Zhang Yang in his planeswalker travels. In story, it's insinuated that Mowu turns into a stone statue for the ability of transporting, but I like Zhang's explanation best. Magic. Kaya is also able to bring along one passenger by possessing them, though this makes for a bumpy ride and neither party has a good time doing this. Aside from Planeswalkers, the Planar Bridge can transport non-organic or dead matter, which is why Nicol Bolas' Lazatip zombie army could breach into Ravnica. The more often one planeswalks, the easier it gets. Whenever they move from one plane to another, they leave a sort of trail that other planeswalkers can pick up on and follow, which can lead to many planeswalker hunts across multiple planes and also lets planeswalkers travel in groups more easily. In the case of the Wanderer, planeswalking is too easy, as she needs to focus to not planeswalk. Otherwise, she can accidentally be rushed into a new plane, making getting a good night's sleep rather difficult. It's uncertain why she's like this, but it's cool, and she's cool, and she needs more spotlight. Wizards, give me Wanderer lore! Planeswalkers are also limited in travels based on their current knowledge. If they've been to a plane already, they have the trail marked so they can more easily travel back and forth. Or they can do what we call an emergency planeswalk, where a planeswalker just jettisons themselves into the blind eternities and lets them end up somewhere random. Although, this form of planeswalking is highly dangerous and not recommended. Ravnica has been a relatively big hub for planeswalkers to meet up in, so much that Rel Zarek was instructed by Niv Mizzet to work on Project Lightning Bug, which would shoot off a lightning bolt whenever it sends planeswalkers' activity moving in or out. This was later modified into the Interplanar Beacon, which shot out energy through the multiverse, drawing in planeswalkers to Ravnica for Nicol Bolas' master plan, unless they were strong enough to resist that pull. My absolute favorite bit of flavor is planeswalkers all have a signature planeswalking particle effect when they planeswalk away. Ral leaves in a flurry of electric sparks, Teo explodes in geometry, Dak fade and disappears in purple smoke, Karn leaves a metallic ping. Okay, well, some are cooler than others, but really, leave a comment on what your planeswalker particle effect would be. Planes also have the ability to break apart and overlap. Nicol Bolas tore the plane of Alara into shards, ripping apart their mana base until they were eventually pulled back together. Aegirim was a blister plane on Ravnica, awkwardly overlaid on it until the Mending sorted the multiverse out and released the two planes, letting the ghosts be free. It remains uncertain whether there are a finite number of planes or an infinite amount. The planeswalker Urza believed that there was a finite number, but too many to ever comprehend and visit. 
The Wanderer believes that there are infinite, but she's been to a few hundred at least. Come on, wizards, please team up the Wanderer and Garak. Give us Planes Chase 2.0 as Garak maps the multiverse following the Wanderer's erratic trail. Please, it'd be so cool and give me more Planes Chase cards to play Oathbreaker with. <sighs> Come on! On top of this main multiverse, there's also time differences that can happen. Most recently, this was done on Tarkir, where the isolated plane was hard reset from having awesome cons and dramatic plot, and Zergo Helm Smasher being an absolute beefcake, to the world being full of dragons. That's it. Yeah, sure, we got Ugin back to life, and Narset got to become a planeswalker, but come on, look what they did to my boy Zergo. On the topic of time travel, Karn the Silver Golem was originally built as a time traveler experiment by Urza and Baron, and did a lot of stuff pre-mending, which is worthy of another video. But also note, he was made of silver, because it's apparently the most resilient to temporal energy. Also note how Emrakul is imprisoned in Estrad's moon, which is also silver. Silver, therefore, must be the strongest element in Magic the Gathering. Note how silver on the periodic table is AG. AG, short for aggro. Red deck wins! There are also parallel multiverses that exist adjacent to this multiverse, which is what the Planar Chaos storyline followed, showing alternate mana affiliations and alternate dimension characters. And finally, there is the Universe, a parallel universe where the silver bordered cards hail from. This includes the plane Bablova from the Unstable set. The Universe also harbors the subsidiary planes that are home to franchises like My Little Pony, The Walking Dead, Transformers. W wait, wait, wait. The Walking Dead is in Black Border? That puts them in the regular multiverse? Are you telling me that there's a zombie Georgia plane? That's so stupid. Why would they do that? They literally said Earth isn't in the main multiverse. So there you have it. You now know how the planes function in Magic the Gathering and how planeswalkers, both the characters and you, the player, operate within the multiverse's rules. Congratulations, you now know more about the Magic World rules than Wizards of the Coast does. If you like this video, let me know so I can keep these lore videos coming. I also make MTG puzzles and other videos relating to the Oathbreaker format. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.